In this episode of BI Dimensions, we're going to be talking about the Pentaho Kettle or PDI CSV file input step. Hi, I'm your host Mark Christensen, and I'm just a tall BI guy. No, really, I'm six foot four. I'm freakishly tall, or at least according to my kids. Hey, have you ever needed to work with CSV files? CSV stands for Comma Separated Value, and uh, they're a very common type of formatted files, and I find myself working with them all the time. And I thought today we'd talk about the CSV file input step in Pentaho Kettle. So let's uh, dig right in. Here we are in Kettle. Let's go ahead and start up a new transform. And look at input. And here's the CSV file input step. Let's drag that in here. And uh, let's also look at the dummy step. We'll just dump our input into the dummy. And uh, we'll connect these two. And yes, we want the main output of the step. Now let's open up the CSV file input step and look at it here. And let's go ahead and look at some of the fields. We've got the step name, of course, which is the name that it uh, shows. And uh, let's look at the file name. So we'll hit browse here and we'll bring up the file we want to look at. Let's start out with statestats.csv. And I'm going to bring up that file so you can take a look and see actually what's in it. So here we have the file. We have a header row and our columns are the state, 2010 population, 2010 rank, 2000 2010 percent change, and 2010 people per square mile. Now let's look at Alabama. Here we have the name and here we have the population in 2010 of Alabama and that's in thousands, so actually Alabama has 4,780,000 people. But you'll notice here that there's a comma in our value, and because that we're working with comma separated values, we have to put quotes around this to make sure that we know that this comma doesn't separate this from another field. And that'll become important in just a minute. <clears throat> Next we have number 23, 7.5, and 94.4. So let's go back to Spoon and take all this into account. Here we have the delimiter. We're working with a comma separated value file. So the delimiter here is comma. We can read in any kind of file, whether it be with, with commas between them or semicolons or quite often tabs are, are used. If you need to use a tab, it's a little bit tricky. Let's uh, delete the uh, delimiter and we'll insert the tab. Now they make this button real handy here so you can insert tab. And you can't see it because the tab is invisible, but if you highlight it, you'll notice that the tab is there. Anyway, we want to use commas, so we're going to get rid of that and use commas. And here we have the enclosure, and we're using double quotes for this file. So those were the quotes that were around that big number with the comma in it to make sure that the we can tell the difference. You know, if, in, if we're in a situation where we have the delimiter actually used in a field, we have to put it inside the enclosure. Here we have the NIO buffer size. I don't think I've ever changed this, but it's the number of characters that are read in from the file at a given time. We can also control lazy conversion, and this is used if you have a lot of fields that you're reading in and a lot of data. It relaxes the amount of conversion that Kettle does on the file and makes it run a little bit faster. Here we have uh, the indication of whether we have a header row or not and in this case we do have the header row because we have all the names up on top this comes in handy because I'll show you in a minute how we can pull in our fields and it'll automatically give us the names of our fields using the header row we can also add the file name to the results that will allow us to pass that file name on from this transform to another transform through, our, through the jobs we can add a row number field so if we want, we can number the rows as we bring them in. We'll look at this a little bit later. We can also run this step in parallel, so we can have multiple CSV file inputs running in parallel, and each one will take a different chunk of the file. There's some caveats with this. It's a little more advanced. I, I wouldn't worry about it at this point. We also need to indicate if we have a new line possible in fields. The new line indicates that there's a character in there that tells that there's a new line. Uh, sometimes it's carries you turn line feeds, line feeds, sometimes it's just line feeds. Our data doesn't have that. Each record in our data 
is, is in its own line, but if there's a possibility where there might be a new line inside a field, you've got to indicate that so it doesn't get confused. We also have the file encoding. Uh, you would probably know if you have some different file encoding. Quite often, this is something like UTF-8 or USA ASCII. Uh, today, we're just going to leave that blank. And down here, we have where we can specify all the fields that are coming in and the information about them. So let's go ahead and use this Get Fields button, which is real handy. We'll click that, and it will go out and sample 100 lines of our data. Now we only happen to have 50. So let's bring this down. And this shows us the results of scanning our data. And so you can kind of breeze through here and see what it goes through. Looking at the data, it is decided that the population, or that the, the state name is a string, population's a number, rank should be an integer, the percent change should be a number, and square miles is a number. And let's bring up our data real quick again, just to refresh our memory. And remember, Alabama is 4,780. So let's go ahead and preview this. And you'll see here that it says that Alabama it has a population of 4,8. So something is obviously wrong. So while I like the get fields, you got to watch it. You got to make sure you check your data. And uh, if you look real carefully, we have our format here of pound point pound, which doesn't really make sense because it's usually because the, the data is set up so it's some number with a comma and you know, some more numbers. But if you come over here and look at the decimal, you'll notice it set up a comma to indicate the decimal instead of a period. Now, depending upon how you use for formatting, uh, here in the U.S. we use uh, decimals, uh, decimal points or the period for to indicate a decimal point, and commas to indicate groups like between millions and billions and thousands. So it goofed up here. So let's go ahead and change this. We're going to change this back to a decimal. We're going to change the group to a comma, and then we're going to change the format. Now the format. Uh, we won't dig into a lot today, but you got to kind of know the basics of it. So you, you can use the pound sign to indicate what the, the format will look like. So because we know that it's going to be you know, some number with a comma and then some more numbers, we'll go pound, 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 then the comma, and pound, pound, pound. And so we don't have any decimal points there, so we don't have to worry about that. If you look down here though, like percent change, and people per square mile, we have uh, commas down here, and the people per square mile, with a decimal point and a pound. And that will indicate that, that there's one decimal point in there. So let's go ahead and preview this. And now we have our population looks just the way we want it to, with 4,780. The rank is 23. The 2010 to 20, I mean 2000 to 2010 percent change is 7.5. People per square mile is 94.4. So that's exactly how we want it. So our data is going to come in just the way we want. So you got to kind of be a little careful with this to make sure that everything looks just right. It sometimes takes a little bit of tinkering around. So I also wanted to show you a little bit different input. I've got a, another transform here that I'm looking at some dates because the formatting with dates gets a little bit goofy sometimes. And let's look at the file. I called it datainput.txt. And here we have two people. We've got Barney Rubble, born on 2-7-1953, and Fred Flintstone on 5-15-51. So let's open up this file input and look down here. Uh, uh, one thing I did want to note, uh, this one I'm adding the row number field. So we'll take a look at that in a minute as well. But the birthday we indicate here what the uh, the format of the date, which is real important. You mess that up, you you screwed up your date. And so let's go back and look at our date. It is in months, days, years is the format we want in. So we selected month, day, years. There is a drop down here that gives you all kinds of different formats to pick from, but you can also enter this yourself. So let's go ahead and open this up with a preview and see if we're pulling in the information the right way. And it does look like we're pulling in the information the right way. 
I always like to kind of double check this because I'm always concerned that the number for the months and the years might get swapped around. Now when Pentaho sucks in the date, it puts it into its own format. So when we want to output it, we can change the format if we want. So I've taken the CSV file input and I, I pump it to uh, dummy. I also put it out here to a text file output. So let's go look at this real quick. I'm gonna look at the field here. Now this formatting is the same for the output fields as it is for our input fields. So I've decided to put a different format here. I've put the year, a four digit year, MM for months, DD for the day. And so the format that we should get out should be four digits for the year, two for the month, two for the day. So let's go ahead and run this. And let's look at our file output. And here's our file output. And we have barn rubble, which I'll explain that in a second. But you notice here the date is 1953-02-07. So that's the format we want. And the row number here is one and two. So it is numbering our rows. So let's go back to our text file output. And you'll notice the first name, I'd set the length to four. So that truncates the file to only have four characters in the output. That's why we're just seeing barn and not Barney. Now, if we want to change the date format, we've got all kinds of things we can select from here. I'm going to, I'll put some uh, show notes about these. Uh, I'll point you to some, in, some information about formatting of this. If we use four M's for the month, it gives the long name. So it won't just, you know, it'll, so it'll spell out December instead of, instead of doing DEC. If you do just two characters, it'll just give you the, the number 12. So now we'll put a space. And let's do DD for the day, comma, space, the year. Let's go four digits for the year. Let's save that and run that. And we'll go look at our output. And you'll notice now, oh, I guess I put a period instead of a comma. Sorry about the typo. But it changed it to February 07 point, because I you know, did the typo. 1953 for the year. If I just put YY, it would have just put 53. If I had put just D instead of DD, it would have just given a 7 instead of 07. So there's all kinds of flexibility with, with the formatting. and uh, But you, you've got to make sure you watch that on your input step here to make sure you get the right format and take a look at that. And when the data comes in, make sure you're getting the data in the right format. Well, I'd like to... Uh, Thank you. That's it for this episode of BI Dimensions. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a comment on my website or on YouTube. And for more information about business intelligence, stop by my website at bidimensions.com. There you can sign up for my mailing list so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Thanks for your time and attention. See you next time.